I've tried to do this video a handful of times, but it's been a bad couple of days and I just keep getting angry <laughs> and having to shut off the recorder and start over. A few months back, I did a video on the fact that billionaire Facebook co-founder Sean Parker came out and without mincing any words at all, he told an audience at Axios that the social media platform that he helped create, Facebook, and others like it, Twitter, Instagram, are literally psychologically programming the population through social validation feedback loops. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while. And it's, a, it's, a val it's a social validation feedback loop. I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. And talk about revelation of the method. I mean, it really doesn't get any more blatant and in your face than that. And I didn't add this in at the time because to me, that admission was bombshell enough that it needed to be given its due on its own without throwing a bunch of other issues in on top of it. However, at the very end of the Axios article on that, they added something else that he said. A little PS, if you will. Having to do with life science allowing people to live longer, more productive lives. But here's what Parker said, quote, Because I'm a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care, so I'm going to be like 160, and I'm going to be part of this, like, class of immortal overlords. I mean, just wow to that statement, you guys. Uh, you know how they do in the dictionary when they put a word and then they put a sentence to as an example of that word? If you were going to put a sentence in as, as an example of what arrogance is, this is perfect right here. This, this should be in there under arrogance because this is the most arrogant thing I've ever heard a person say with a straight face in front of other people. So that's what the real wealth gap is. It's not the superficial wealth. It's the ultimate logical conclusion of that wealth in relation to the steering of scientific research and technological progress and the fact that by having so much money, people like Parker, who by the way at age 38 just so happens to be the founder and chair of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, I just can't imagine why, uh, these people are saying that through technology, they will be able to live twice as long as everyone else, twice as long as the average pleb, referring to himself as joining a class of immortal overlords. I mean, just... <laughs> just the first part I can't get over. Because I'm a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care. So, I mean, it's... I just, every time I see that, I think about every person I know who's been damaged by the completely abhorrent quote-unquote healthcare system in this country. Because it obviously doesn't work this way for billionaires, but for the average person, it's impossible to really afford it. And even if you can afford it, what you end up affording is them filling you full of chemicals that do more damage than anything and ripping things out of you as a way of curing your diseases i mean it's it's sick it's a really sick twisted the allopathic medicine system is sick and twisted but that's not even the point the point is here's this billionaire sitting up there going well because i'm a billionaire i can afford better health care than the rest. i mean i when i see this and after watching the other clip of him talking i actually feel like he said it something more like because I'm a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care. So I'm going to be like 160 and I'm going to be part of this like class of immortal overlords. It's probably something more like that. <laughs> and of course, by the very use of the term overlords, I guess they'll be lording over the rest of us. <laughs> I guess that's what he's saying. And nowhere in the media, you guys, nowhere at all did anyone even bat an editorial eyelash at that statement. Then in brackets, you have laughter, because I guess the people there were like, oh, that's so funny, he's going to be living longer and be our overlord. I mean, I don't know why they would even think that's funny. I mean, you want to hope when you see laughter in brackets like that, what happened actually was those people were sitting out in the audience and they were so uncomfortable by what he said, they had the nervous laughter, 
These guys are coming out everywhere right now, these panels and these speaking events, and they're just admitting eye-popping, jaw-dropping things to people. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. But everybody else has to soul search a little bit more about what you're willing to do because your behaviors, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. And people always just laugh like it's hilarious. You're probably the most likely to fall for it. Because <laughs> you were checkboxing your whole life. Like it's just a funny joke. And the thing of it is, is these guys aren't joking. <laughs> If you watch the thing and you watch, I mean, they didn't put a clip of him saying that for obvious reasons, but if you watch the other thing where he's talking, he's not kidding around what he's saying. He's being pretty blatantly clear about exactly what he's saying. It's not a joke. It's not funny. <laughs> they're coming out right now and they are telling you what is about to happen in society in the coming not so distant future in our lifetimes, in the next few decades, in the next few years, how things are progressing with all this technology that's coming out and the things that they're planning to do with it. And they're telling everyone in their face right now how it's gonna be. And people either don't get it at all, or they're just unwilling to really look behind the curtain of Oz, or I'm not sure. And I get it, when people think of Silicon Valley, they think, of course, of all this tech in terms of computers and hardware and software and this idea, this nebulous idea of computer stuff, right? They don't think about how many of these guys are funding medical technology research to the tune of millions of dollars uh, for treatments that do exactly what Parker just said, so they can live forever or I guess at the very least live a whole lot longer than human beings naturally do on this planet at the time that we're living in right now. Ambrosia, a Bay Area startup apparently named after the food of the Greek and Roman gods, is currently injecting the blood of young people into wealthy older venture capitalists to reverse aging, apparently as a scientific study. but. Tell me what kind of scientific study you have ever heard of in your life where the participants pay $8,000 a pop to be in it and it's not randomized at all and there's no control group to verify the results against. I mean, is that, by any stretch of the imagination, does that sound like a scientific study to you? It sounds like a high-tech version of vampirism with the modern day veneer of medical offices and official titles like scientific study. And you have all these companies right now, I can't even list them all, but I mean, the, the co-founders of Google, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they started a company called Calico, and that whole company is about finding the root causes of aging so they can reverse it and extend lifespan. And everything they're doing is of course being kept top secret. You have a company called Unity Biotechnology, that's backed by PayPal's Peter Thiel and Amazon's Jeff Bezos, and they're developing drugs that actually target and destroy certain types of cells that are associated with aging. So you have a lot of these companies, like a lot of them that are coming out. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people like Silicon Valley's Sam Altman. He's another Bilderberg attendee and co-chairman of OpenAI. He's also the president of Y Combinator, which is the UBI company we talked about in our short film, Obsolete. Well, he was in the news uh, back in March because he joined with a, a startup company called Nectome founded by two MIT AI researchers so that he can be put on a waiting list to be killed I'm assuming at the end of his life and have the entire his entire brain preserved in such a manner that they can upload the entire contents of it onto a, a computer so his consciousness can live on after he dies Altman told the MIT Technology Review Quote, I assume my brain will be uploaded to the cloud. And this is a whole separate topic, the cloud. I'm, I cannot get into that in this video, but all of these, there's a lot of tech guys and AI guys that are coming out right now, and they're really pushing this idea that pretty soon we're all going to be jacking our brains directly into the cloud, like it's the matrix, we're just going to plug our brains into it. Uh, we will connect wirelessly our neocortex to the cloud. This is with nanobots that... Exactly. that enter your your neocortex right and i just have to tell you guys that every time i hear one of these guys say something like that because they're saying this is the next thing that's going to be happening in the next decade or so or a couple decades and maybe sooner depends who you ask but 
Just a nightmarish menagerie of every hive mind movie I've ever seen in my life just comes flashing forward to the front of my brain every time I hear them talk about it. The worms are in their brains! I'm not gonna get into that right now, but I mean, this, this idea of using technology to transcend the human condition and become like a demigod. This is some age old stuff we're talking about. None of this is new idea. This is not even remotely new at all. It just seems new to most people because we have all this technology right now and it just seems all new and high tech, but that is an age old concept that we're talking about. That's a whole nother video too, but this whole thing, this whole system, it is just rife with eugenical underpinnings. I mean, just the first part of his statement, I'm a billionaire, so I can afford better healthcare than everyone else. I mean, what's the flip side of that? Everyone else can't, so they're gonna die way sooner than me. I mean, that's basically what that statement means. Clearly, these are technologies and treatments that are being created and rolled out and offered to a select few. I mean, I've mentioned before how in 2014, billionaire Bill Gates did an interview with Rolling Stone where he just came right out and said, innovation can really be your enemy if you're not careful because we can't just make new medical technologies be available to everyone. I mean, this, you know, like that, with that kind of attitude. And the reporter says something like, yeah, but when you get into that, you start hearing loaded phrases like death panels. Yes, reporter, you do start hearing those phrases because that's essentially what the man is saying. It's not, it's not a loaded phrase, it's just the truth. That's what he's essentially saying. We cannot offer medical technologies to everyone and they might die younger or sooner or whatever because their life is just not the same value put on that life as a billionaire's life. That really is ultimately what's being said. I mean, the obvious takeaway is these things are made so outrageously expensive in the first place so that only certain people who are super rich can afford it. Look, I live in a country right now where if I go into the emergency room and they give me an aspirin, something that I can buy a bottle of, you know, down the street at Walgreens for like $3, if they give me an asp one aspirin, they're going to charge me $18 for it. And you can't tell me, nobody can tell me that's not by design that we have that situation going on here. And it's funny that reporter brings up the loaded phrase of death panels because it reminds me of former White House special advisor on Obamacare, Ezekiel Emanuel, Rahm Emanuel's brother. You guys remember him? He was one of the co-authors of the Obamacare legislation. And he came out and wrote an entire op-ed in The Atlantic about why he hopes that he dies at 75 because that's the optimal age to die. And it had charts and it was all about how basically after the age of 65, you don't, you're don't you done contributing to society and your worth to society is dried up. You don't, there's nothing important for you to do anymore. Your creativity is gone and you're pretty much just going downhill towards death. So your life is basically no, of no value to society after that point. And so at age 75, you should just go bow out. Like it's a stage play, you should just exit stage left. I would love to revisit this when that guy actually hits 75 and see if he's gonna stand by that statement. But I would just go ahead and add that what he's really saying is that's for the majority of everyone else. It's not for people like Sean Parker over there sitting up on stage totally bragging about the fact that he and his Silicon Valley elite friends are going to be in a class of what he describes as immortal overlords. I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. <laughs> they live to be more than twice as old. To put an exclamation point on the end of that sentence, Parker finished up his comment by saying, quote, because you know the Warren Buffett expression about compound interest, give us billionaires an extra hundred years and you'll know what wealth disparity looks like. Just wow. Give us billionaires an extra hundred years and you'll know what wealth disparity looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and say that in 10 years, society's not gonna look like anything that I recognize. And again, when the media reports on the wealth gap, they do it in the most superficial, 
obvious possible way. And I think that is done on purpose so that people will not follow that out to its logical conclusion. I think the majority of everyone has no idea what the wealth gap really is. 